Hey, welcome everybody to the uh, first episode of Too Much Shenanigans. Uh, and uh, we are two librarians at Kirkwood Public Library. So as you can see up in the corner there. Uh, and I'm Shannon. And I'm Shannon. That's Shannon. <laughs> And uh, so we were going to start this off uh, as a blog originally, and we had written introductions for ourselves for that. And so we're going to actually read those to introduce ourselves. So um, take it away, Shannon, because we're, yeah, go <laughs> Shannon. <laughs> so first up, we're going to learn a bit about the other Shannon. So Shannon with two N's is the older but shorter of the two. She is originally from Salt Lake City, Utah, and has lived in the St. Louis area for almost three years. She is a teen librarian IT associate, so you will usually find her in the teen room or off providing tech support. In her free time, she reads YA fiction, all genres, true crime, and adult fantasy sci-fi. She plays video games, board games, card games, and tabletop RPGs. She is also a dungeon game master. She watches professional wrestling, listens to audiobooks while coloring in one of her many coloring books, and occasionally sits her butt down to write. The book she rereads every year is The Western Game by Ellen Raskin. Her favorite authors are Holly Black, Mira Grant, oh no, Shannon, I can't pronounce this next author's name. Shannon McGuire. <laughs> Great. Shannon McGuire and Agatha Christie. Her favorite movies are Clue and The Last Unicorn. She doesn't have a favorite TV show because she doesn't watch that much, and her favorite food is macaroni and cheese. Shannon lives with her husband and their very spoiled cat, Scratch. <laughs> All right, and introducing other Shannon. Uh, Shannon with one N, Barton, is the younger but taller of the two. She is a St. Louis native who spent most of her formative years growing up amongst the stacks of Kirkwood Public Library. She is a teen and children's librarian, so you will find her floating around the basement of the library like some friendly ghost that's hard to catch. In her free time, she reads whatever fancies her, but has been digging historical supernatural books. She plays board games, plans nerdy themed parties, dances Lindy Hop, listens to music, especially musicals and K-pop, dabbles in all the creative arts, and consumes an altogether unhealthy amount of Netflix and other visual media. And yes, of course she has a spreadsheet to prove it. The book she rereads every year is Tuck Everlasting by Natalie Babbitt. She doesn't have favorite authors, but is always impressed with the work of Amy Krauss Rosenthal. Her favorite movies are Forrest Gump, When Harry Met Sally, and Newsies. Her favorite TV show is Lost. And her favorite food is pizza rolls, though she will consume anything from the pizza tree. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, the concept that we had for this little vlog series is that the two of us are just going to kind of go back and forth sharing different things in the media world that we have consumed lately. Uh, and then we're just going to ask questions about it, talk about it, if you'd like. You can go ahead and ask your own questions in the little chat over to the side, uh, and we'll do our best to respond throughout the show this evening. Okay, so I think I'm starting yes. uh, with Crescent City, House of Blood and Bone by Sarah J. Moss, uh, which is uh, Sarah J. Moss's newest uh, book out. Uh, I did read the physical copy, but I do know it is available on Overdrive. However, uh, I think there's a wait list for it on Overdrive right now, but trust me, it'll definitely be worth it to put it on hold. Uh, so, just to let you know, I wasn't expecting much from this book, and I actually okay. only chose to read it for content, because mm. what... <laughs> so, I read Court of Thorns and Roses, which is one, like her, one of her most famous books uh for ya and i actually didn't like it that much so i was like eh but because she's so popular and this one like i couldn't get a clear answer whether it was adult or ya i decided to read for content and wow this book was totally not what i was expecting at all mm -hmm. uh in, in a good way um 
it was kind of hard for me to get through at first. Um, like the first few chapters, it was kind of like slow and the main character I didn't really like. Mm-hmm. But then once it picked up, it really picked up and I just couldn't put it down. I read this. It, so it's, it's a big book, 799 oh, pages. Nice, nice. I read it in two days. <laughs> Like, okay, wow, that's like you know, I was doing the thing where you're like walking around with the book, you know, and then you're like eating with the book and doing things. Yeah, oh my gosh. that's what I was doing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, like you're just walking around with it all the mm-hmm. time. Um, so basically, the book is like urban fantasy. It's like an urban fantasy detective mystery, Ooh, which nice. is kind nice. of yeah. I know I wasn't expecting that at all. Yeah, like no. the mystery part of it, uh, and then like her world building just like blew my mind it has like fey angels shifters Mm -hmm. creatures i don't even know what they are or (laughs) never heard of but like all in this world with like cell phones the internet video chat um yeah so it was like i really liked that intersection of like these there's these angels flying through the sky with like witches on brooms but talking on their cell phone at the same time (laughs) <laughs> like yeah right i know it's like it was totally unexpected uh the the images um let's see the the main characters are uh hunt who is a um fallen angel uh assassin and then uh bryce is a half fey um she works in like a like an art museum kind of. So anyway, those are the two main characters. And I must say that their chemistry is very steamy. So that. Okay. Um, so like on the steamy (laughs) scale of like, I don't even know like what appropriate, uh, a scale for this would be like, I I think of like the, the, we'll put in terms of water maybe. Uh, so like in terms of like, you know, a puddle on the ground maybe is like the lowest level to like, Full on like sauna in a volcano. Where where are we at on this spectrum? <sighs> <laughs> um, it was so it was like probably towards the top of the spectrum, I would okay. say. All right. So like it was like, woo, yeah. And what's interesting is apparently I like I said, I, I read I've read a court of thorns and roses, but I didn't continue on with the that content the sexual content in the book Mm -hmm. considering this is an adult book apparently there's not as much in this as there is in the ya uh court of thorns and roses of course naturally so yeah a friend told me that and i was like that's interesting but it's still like the tension you know like the tension is like there and you're just like waiting and waiting for it so yes and so anyway yes it was that was one of the highlights of the book, of course. Um, hmm. And then I also must mention that, so she has a full fey brother named Rune. And he was, he like, I was like, man, he needs to be my fictional boyfriend. Cause <laughs> he, <laughs> yeah, he was, he was a like, I liked that the perspective kind of, yeah, changed um, between, mostly it was like, from Bryce or Hunt's point of view but sometimes the chapters would be from Rune's point of view which I liked Hmm. um and then like so I've talked about the steamy part but then I also must mention that I think uh Sarah J Moss did a really good job of portraying PTSD oh um I don't want to like give you spoilers or anything but something happens at the very beginning of the book that basically destroys uh bryce uh and her world and so basically most of the book is she's very traumatized and broken and i think she did a really good job of showing what that's like she also uh bryce does have panic attacks and as someone who has panic attacks um I thought her description of it was really accurate uh, and sympathetic. So I, I really appreciated that part of the book in that it's fantasy and there's so much going on, but at the same time, and like, you know, and these are like angels and fairies and stuff, but they still have the same type of like um, 
psychological issues that humans do. So that was that was a good part of the book that I really appreciated. So, um, <laughs> and then let's see what else. Uh, the last 200 pages, I would just warn you. Okay, so yeah, it's a big book. Yeah. Um, totally worth it. Like I said, I couldn't put down. But the last 200 pages totally went, like, you're thinking, okay, this is a cool mystery with fantasy. And then it just got intense. And I basically spent, like, the last 200 pages sobbing my eyes out. Okay, that's what I hear so... about all of her books, though. Like, every single person who <laughs> reads any of these books by this woman, like, they're just like, I cried for, like, three hours at the ending of this book I'm like, <laughs> why would i ever want to read this this is so so sad but it was like well it's funny because it was like i was crying but i was cheering and being like yeah but also crying at the oh. same time so oh. it's you know and it's like a, it's yeah i and there is i, I can't give you spoilers yeah, no but there is a scene i'll just say la haba forever for anybody who has been hmm. who has actually read the book uh, yeah, it was just, like, so well-written and powerful that, yeah, it was one of the most powerful scenes I've read in, in books, and, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, so you're like, who wants to cry for <laughs> that long, but, I, I mean, it felt totally worth it, mm -hmm. and then, you know, it kind of, it ended on a, uh, you know, a happier note, <laughs> and, but... It also ended on a total like cliffhanger. So, is there I'm, more books? Yeah. Like, is it a series or is this just like a, yes. one and done? She's going to have a series, but okay. well, I certainly hope so because <laughs> if she doesn't, <laughs> I'll be really angry because um, she left it, you know, totally on a cliffhanger. So, yes, the sequel needs to be out like yesterday. But um, since this one came out uh, in March, I believe it was mm -hmm. I out i'll get the next book especially if she's gonna write like as big of a book as she did this yeah. time yeah probably not till next year or the year after so but i highly recommend it um i will say that i sarah j moss is mainly known as a ya author i think they were planning on this being more of her adult fantasy debut um i do know a lot of teenagers will be interested in reading it Based on the content, um, not just there's, there's sexual content, but there's also a lot of swearing, uh, and there are there is quite a bit of drug use as well in the book. So I would recommend it for 16 and older. Okay. Uh, if people are interested in like if it's appropriate for their teenager to read. Okay. So, yep. All right. Okay. So that is yes. House of Blood and Bone. Well, yeah. this, this is a good transition into my first thing, because I'm going to be talking about another book that is very long uh, and also has a lot of readers frustrated because they want to see the end of the series and it hasn't happened yet. So uh, my first book is called The Name of the Wind by Patrick Rothfuss. Are you familiar with this book, Shannon? No, I'm not, actually. Okay. All right. So <laughs> I just kind of assumed jumping into this that like, Anybody who is interested in fantasy would probably be aware of this thing. Um, but I wasn't aware of it until like this past year when my friend told me to read it. And okay. so I started this journey reading this book actually like back in September. And I it's only was like a month or two ago that I finished the second book because the first book is 600 something pages, which isn't too terrible. Um, but the second book in the series is like a thousand pages and so these are definitely wow. like, <laughs> it's it's intense uh like but the it's actually a very easy going read um well for the most part we'll get to that but uh the way that it's written is it's done in a lot of these very very short chapters and so it's it's easy to pick up get caught up in a chapter and be like well okay yeah i can go ahead and read the next one um and so you can get through it, um, but you just got to know you are in for a journey. So this series, to sum it up, is about this heroic, legendary, ultimate guy, I guess, that you would think about hearing in a story. And he is working now in an inn, and he decides that he's going to tell his entire life to this chronicler who stops by. And the concept of this trilogy is that the first book is going to be the first day of him telling his story. 
The second book is the second day of him telling the story. And the third book, which has not been released yet, uh, ah. is going to be uh, the third day of this epic story about his life. And uh, so you start off when he's a very, very young boy um, and it goes into his school age years and then onward as he gets older uh, as a teenager. And we end the series or the second book, I think somewhere around the time when he's late teens, maybe we're at early 20s. I don't remember, honestly. So much has happened during it. Um, <laughs> You're like, they're big books. It's hard to, it <laughs> to keep well, track of it is. It's just, it's, uh, my friend, the reason why he likes it so much is because it is similar, he said, to kind of like a, a D&D adventure feel um, with like all like, so all these like little quests that he has to go on. He meets like all these friends along the way that he'll travel with and he'll do these things with. Um, and then maybe he'll go with a different set of people for a while. And um, it, I definitely can see that appeal and why it feels like that. Um, but for this book, I feel like I have to break it up into prose of the book and cons of the book. Okay, um, wow. Yeah, because it's... <laughs> It's very good, but I definitely have some thoughts about it that make me not happy. Um, okay. So the prose of this book is that it has some of the greatest world building I have read in a series in a long time. Um, I think how enraptured I got with exploring this world and trying to understand it. Um, I could say is akin to when I was reading things like Harry Potter growing up and just being like, what is this whole like new magical place and trying to discover it. Um, and it definitely leaves you lingering and wanting more within this world again, which is why it's so frustrating that there is not a third book out to explain a lot of the things. Um, because the second thing that kind of ties into that is it has amazing lore about like the, I, I don't want to spoil too much of the story. And I know I haven't said like a whole lot, but I really do think it's more fun kind of like jumping into this and discovering it along the way. But like, the, there's these mystical beings um, that come up early on in the series that you hear a lot about. And again, they're in all this legend and this lore. And throughout the series, you find out more about them. But again, they, like it's my favorite part of it. And I want to know everything possible <laughs> about it. And I can't. And there's not been any answers. And I'm very mad at Patrick Rothfuss for it. Um, and so How well, long has it been? Oh, yeah, like jeez. I think the second book came out in like 2009. So it's been a, Oh. Yeah, wow. it's like one of those That's series like, where you're like is it going to happen? Are we going to He's like get pulling a, a George R R Martin thing yeah. here. Yeah, it's oh, definitely wow. like one of those things. Um and so while we're we're in this mood now where uh we're not happy with how we haven't gotten anything from this author since then, let's talk about the major flaw of this book, which is, in fact, its portrayal of female characters. Um, oh. Yep, yep, you know what I'm talking about. This, yep. it makes me so mad because it's obvious that this author knows how to write very compelling and interesting characters, except for women, because apparently all the women in this book love our main hero um, in some way or the other, and uh, it's so... <laughs> infuriating because every time you get one in the series and you're just like oh yeah this is gonna be a strong female character who you know is just doing her own thing she doesn't care about our hero uh no then she ends up uh you know falling in love with him or having a crush on him trying to pursue him she's like oh my gosh come on people like you don't <laughs> ever yeah. the one wow it's, yeah it's that would get really annoying i think there is only one character in the series so far that I that I can think of that does not have some sort of interest in our main hero. Um, but it's also because she's like really, really old and like a grandmother. So I would hope. <laughs> well, that that's wouldn't... good. That would be a little awkward. <laughs> oh, it would be. Um, but oh, it is. It, I could rant uh, for hours and I have ranted for hours about how much I hate this aspect of the book. Um, but the only thing that I guess makes me feel better about it um, is that when talking about it, my friend, like he said, that you have to view it from the lens of our main character is the one telling the story. And so That's therefore, a good point. Um, from his perspective, maybe everyone would be falling in love with him. Uh, yeah, that's obsessed true. with him. And so I'm like, ugh. Okay, 
That is a good point. The narrator, yeah. it, you know, it could be he could be totally unreliable and is like, yes, of course, these women were all in love with me. So yeah, that that's yeah. that's a good point. So, so I'm I'm trying to hold on to that, but there was definitely some moments in both books, um, in this one and in the sequel, Wise Man's Fear, but in the second book, I definitely just rolled my eyes, closed the book, threw it, like, across my bed. I was just like, no, I am done with this. Like, it was one of these sections where I started reading it, and I was like, oh, this is a dream sequence. This is fine. And then I realized 60 pages later, nah, this isn't a dream sequence. This is reality, <laughs> and I hate it. So It's his yeah. dream sequence. Yeah. Is it, it was. <laughs> yeah, I guess that that is the way to think of it. So... Yeah, yeah, as much as I just said terrible things, it is a very good book, very fascinating lore. The writing is very well done, and you do just find yourself getting caught up in it. Uh, but just be aware that if you are a person who cannot stand it when they don't have strong female characters, just avoid this book. It'll just make you very angry. Or if you want to read a complete series and want an author to write the book, uh, yes. you know, after 11 years, <laughs> that's yep. like a really long time to yeah. wait to write the third. So, yeah. Okay. Yep. Uh, is it available on Overdrive or Hoopla? Or yes. I think Patriots? there's an ebook for both this one and the second one on Overdrive. Um, okay. Usually, I feel like there is, like, a short waiting list. Like, they're always being checked out. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Definitely get on the hold list. And it, it is long, though. So, you'll definitely have to, be, like, be on top of it with reading. And you may have to check it out more than once. But uh, mm -hmm. it's, like I said, it's probably worth it. Um, especially because, in theory, at some point, there's going to be a TV show, and Lin-Manuel Miranda oh. said he wants to write the music for it, and being a Lin-Manuel Miranda fan, uh, that's kind of also was what drew me into it. I was like, oh, well, if Lin loves this book, well, I have to love this book. Yeah, well, so, that's cool. Yeah. So, but, all right. Yeah, let's go on to uh, okay. your next thing, then. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. So my next thing is uh, I've been listening to the audiobook um, of, well, actually, I'm on the third one now, but I'm going to talk about the first <laughs> one. Because uh, <laughs> so you can tell that I like it. Mm -hmm. um, so it's Truth Witch by Susan Dennard. Uh, and since I'm listening to the audiobook, it is read by Cassandra Campbell. Uh, I checked out the audiobook on the Overdrive app and I listened to it on my phone. Um, and. I, I'd seen the, so it's called the Witchlands series mm -hmm. and there's going to be, so right now there's three books and I'm on the third, <laughs> which means I'm going to run out of content soon. Mm -hmm. uh, the fourth one is supposed to be out next year. And then there's going to be a fifth one, I think out in 2022. So I'll just have to be patient. Of course I started a series that's not done, but I picked it out one because I liked the cover. Mm -hmm. And two, I just heard good things about the Witchland series, and I was like, it's available on Overdrive. I needed a new book to listen to, mm -hmm. and so I checked it out on a whim. And I'm so glad I did, because it is actually really, really well done. Um, I'll talk about the book first, and then I'll talk about the audio part of it um, cool. second. So, because, you know, like, uh, having it read to you, that's a different part than um, just reading. But the book itself, it has really detailed world building, and um, it has a unique magic system, which is something I really love in fantasy books and I look for, actually, is uh, unique, different styles of magic. Because with fantasy books, sometimes it can get, like, really repetitive with this is how you do magic. And, you know, so this one is really unique uh, in that uh, there's like wells of magic, but they're like, they've like broken. So magic is starting to die. So not everyone mm. is a witch. Um, and the wells are ether, void, wind, fire, earth, water. And nice. Susan Dennard actually has stated that she got the inspiration from uh, Last Avatar and yes. the Airbender. <laughs> so I just started watching that today. So that's perfect. Yeah. But, um, and what's cool about it is, so there's people who are born witches. Some have just a little bit of power. Some have a lot of power. So it's like full witch versus, but it's in this world of empires mm -hmm. that is very reminiscent of like, um, 
eight the eighteenth century world with like pirate ships. There's pirate ships. Mm, there's mm. ships basically, nice. and there's like ship battles, but with witches doing magic, which is really cool. Yes. So and the different witches. There's like um. So the main characters are Sophia and Isolde. And Sophia is a truth witch, which is a very, very rare magic and um, very sought after. So she can tell when somebody is lying, uh, which you can understand why people would want her because, you know, to like work for them, uh, like the imp- the emperors and stuff. And then uh, Isolde is what's known as a thread witch. So in the world, um, people... She can see people's threads, which means she can see what their moods are, what they're feeling, and then who they're bound to. There's, like, threads that bind and threads that break. Um, So, like, she can see if they, who they're in love with, because there's a thread between them and their, their heart thread is Mm -hmm. what it's called. Um, And the two of them are thread sisters, meaning they have a thread between them that bonds them as best friends. Um, So I really liked the idea of threads being around people showing what they feel it's kind of like auras i guess but also i liked how the threads you know she could see like how they're bound to different people and everything in relationship wise so um and their relationship is the main like whole story through the these books um is them like being thrust apart and Mm -hmm. then trying to find their way back to each other um and I guess I'm talking about Truth Witch, but it's hard because I'm like, I've listened to Truth Witch, Wind Witch, and I'm in the middle of Blood Witch now. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, what happened in Truth Witch? That only happened in Truth Witch. <laughs> um, yeah, but, uh, and then Pirate Ships. That's what's so, there's also, of course, a couple of love interests, uh, Merrick and Edwin. Um, Edwin is a blood witch, and so he's considered, like, uh, he's, his magic is super rare as well. He can control the blood in people's bodies. Nice. Uh, and also, he automatic, his body automatically heals him. So he can get, like, shot with, like, 17 arrows, and his body will heal him. It's, it's really, yeah, it's <laughs> kind of insane. So um, I do love how the perspective um, shifts from character to character. So it's in the third person, but, you know, one part, it's obviously from Sophia's point of view. Next, it's from his souls. Then you get Edwin's point of view and Merrick's point of view. And then each book actually adds on another point of view. So like in the sec- the second book, it adds uh, Merrick's sister and then in the third one, it's adding, who did it add? Um, oh, yeah, uh, Merrick's sister's first mate. I'm trying to remember her name now, and I can't. <laughs> Sticks. Um, yeah, so it's like, you know, as you go through, you're getting more perspectives on what's going on in the world. And basically, the empires are going back to war. There was a 20-year truce, and now they're going back to fighting each other. And there's just all this so there's war in the background and killing and and stuff um and i really appreciated that each character is actually really complicated Hmm. and they have um like complicated motives and they change and grow throughout um the books uh in even just in one book you can see their character progression which i really appreciate and i think it was really well written um and yeah, so I really liked um, Truth Witch, and I did like that I, I listened to it on audiobook, but I will. <laughs> so talk about the audiobook <laughs> part. Yeah. So Cassandra Campbell, uh, the narrator, she does a good job. Uh, she does go kind of overboard on the accents. Oh, So, fun. yes, because okay. apparently the characters have accents that I I'm not actually sure where to how to place them <laughs> um they're like I'm not, you know because it's a fantasy world so like this person's from Kartora and this person's from mm-hmm. Marstaki and stuff but then the accents I'm like is this like is this a, a a Persian accent or is she supposed to be German I I don't know I can't tell do you think like, and, it's intentional to not have it be a specific like 
place, or is that just like how yeah, it maybe. ended up? I don't know, honestly. And but so, <laughs> like it, it's uh, it, but it grows on you after a while. Okay. Like I appreciated it at first. I was like, why is she talking like this? All whenever anybody talks, they have an accent, and it was like I was like. What, where are they supposed to be from? What is going on? <laughs> um, but like it, it actually has grown on me uh, after a while. I actually do kind of like it because I can sometimes the accent with different people is slightly different. So then it helps to differentiate who's talking. Um, plus, it's just now I feel like immersed in it. And so mm-hmm. like you're like in the book and you're like, yes, everybody speaks with this weird accent in this world. So... <laughs> Um, there is the downside to listening to the audiobook is um, not seeing the map. So oh, nice, there's a map. Oh yes, I the love Witch maps. Have a map. Yeah, I know. Well, because I'm listening to the book and they keep talking about these places, you mm-hmm. know, and like, okay, we're going on, and they are at sea for quite a bit of the first <laughs> book. Yeah. Um, you know, and so they're talking about sailing along this coast, and I'm like what and so i actually had to look it up online uh, so i could like see the map of this world because i'm like what are they talking about and so that's one downside to listening to it on audiobook because you can't like open the physical yeah. book and see the map you know and flip back to it to see what they're talking about um but it's there's actually it's got its own wiki and like website with all sorts of information so you can find the map of the witchlands really easily uh to uh look it up so um yeah i mean that's so i recommend it as an interesting audiobook with really like detailed world building and uh and i would say i this is just the teen librarian in me because this is a (laughs) ya book i'm like how old should they be to read this Mm. um I, I was, it's, the only thing is that it's pretty bloody and there's lots of violence, but yeah. I honestly think that it would be okay for 13 and up. Sweet. So if, yeah, if they were interested in that, there is, there's fighting, but there's also, um, you know, some, some romance as well. And it's, I think it's a really good balance for a, a YA fantasy book. So, and the audiobook is on overdrive. Um, you can, I think you might be able to check it out now, except for Blood Witch, because I have that checked out right now. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So, all right. So moving on to... Yes. Uh, now Katie's I'm going to go down. ahead, yeah, talk about um, the latest musical craze that is in my life. So I guess when quarantine first all started, like, happening, um, this was a musical that was on my list for a while that I knew that, like, I need to listen to and, if possible, like, see. Um, because back in 2019, it won eight Tony Awards, uh, including Best Musical, Original Score, uh, Orchestration, Sound Design, Lighting Design, Scenic Design, Direction, and then act, uh, Featured Actor. Um, so it, wow. It, yeah. Eight at the Tonys is a pretty good, pretty good deal. Um, mm-hmm. And I remember seeing like uh, the performance of Wait for Me uh, from the Tony Awards, like was going around YouTube and stuff. And I was like, all right, it's time for me to sit down and get serious about this musical. And oh man, uh, I have now probably listened to this soundtrack. Um, I think in the month of May, I legitimately did listen to it at least once every single day. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> it's, it was just like playing on repeat in the background, basically, as I did work from home. Um, and I would just like have a song stuck in my head. And I would just talk to all of my friends, I feel like, about it all the time. Um, but for those of you who have no idea what Hades Town is about, uh, it's a retelling of the Orpheus Eurydice myth. Um, and so you get to see them as characters in this world as well well as Hades and Persephone. Um, so I always tell people, if you're a fan of Lore Olympus, the webcomic, you'll want to check this out just because there's some interesting parallels. And uh, I don't know, I just, I love them both. And so I think other people probably would too. Uh, and, but it's cool because it's set in this world that's like a, a like a Great Depression era, um, sort of like Louisiana uh, jazz type of feeling. Um, and it's just, it's- Oh, cool. Yeah. It is really neat, and I think when you, like, watch production, like, a lot of the costumes all kind of have this vibe of, like, they're they're raggedy, like, it's, like, people almost look like they're working in a coal mine, um, 
you know, it, it's, it's just wraps you into like this kind of, this, like I said, this depression that's happening in the world at this time. And um, I think a lot of aspects of it feel very similar to maybe a lot of like uh, global warming crises and things that are happening. Like they, they haven't had like spring in forever because Persephone is no longer returning to the world. Oh. Um, or when she's here, it's for such a short time that like nothing grows. And so there's just like famine and sickness and people um, are dying because of the winter and stuff. And so along comes Orpheus, of course, who has the gift of song. And he is able to bring back some of this greenery to this world. And he decides he's going to sit down and write this song um, that's going to bring back spring forever. Meanwhile, though, you have the gods coming into play and Hades shows up. Uh, you have Eurydice, who she's a human, um, but she catches Hades' eye, and Hades is having trouble with his wife Persephone, and so the gods, <laughs> of course, as always, start meddling in the human world, and soon enough, uh, you have this adventure unfolding where Orpheus has to save Eurydice, um, not just from Hades, but also kind of from herself, maybe a little bit. Uh, but anyway, so that that's the overall like summary, and I, if you don't know uh, the myth of like Eurydice and Orpheus, I would advise maybe not reading up on it beforehand, just because otherwise you'll oh, probably yeah. have spoilers um, for this. But even myself, like going into this, being very familiar with it, uh, I, I still found myself getting really wrapped up in the story. Again, it made me kind of mad because like, oh, I know it's going to happen here. Uh, but it was just, it was so cool. And what's What's great about the music, like I said, is it's this sort of like New Orleans jazz feel and being a swing dancer, um, it's like my favorite type of music to listen to as far as like swing dancing goes. And it's cool because in the production, they have the band on the stage playing all the music and like sometimes interacting with like the characters. And so oh, it's like you're like awesome. inside a restaurant or a bar at a lot of times. Um, uh -huh. And so... Yeah, the, the music is just very vibrant. All of the players are very involved in it, I feel like. Um, and the, the songs just get stuck in your head. And like I said, it's one of those musicals that I think there's a lot of lyrics that the more times you listen to it, the more lyrics you're like, oh, wow, that actually hits kind of close to home right there. Or like, oh, geez, that's really relevant. Um, and again, I don't want to spoil anything for it. But definitely, if this is one of those musicals that you have not tapped into yet it might be just the thing you want to start doing uh during this time while you have it uh and i definitely recommend going to youtube at least and checking out the different um animated things that people create for the songs um the animatics are really like they're just they're so cute they're so so cute oh wow so it. people take the songs and like make oh, yeah. animation yes they like hand draw like it all and so like if you were like a disney renaissance fan um i mean i recommend this for any musical because it's just incredible the amount of talent and work that people put on youtube uh oh, for I know. their love of just like musicals and these things and it's just beautiful animation and you're just like oh why why don't you just animate the entire thing for me so i can watch it on repeat <laughs> Um, but yeah, it's, it's a quality musical. It's good. Uh, obviously if it ever comes around again, you know, and theaters open back up, definitely recommend seeing it, uh, cause there's some cool things with it. But in the meantime, you can always, uh, check it out on Hoopla at any point in time. It's on there. Um, there's no whole the soundtrack for that. Yes. The soundtrack for okay. it. Um, uh -huh. you might be able to find clips and things of the show, like I said, yeah, on maybe. YouTube for it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's fun. Like I said, I've listened to it way too many times, but it, it's worth it. It's a good one. Nice. Um, it does sound, it. does sound interesting to me. I. A musical with like New Orleans jazz. I think I might listen to it. So yes, yeah. like that's definitely like it's the first opening notes of it. Um, I think are like a trombone solo, and you're just like, oh yes, latching on. We're doing this. Uh, and it nice. yeah, it just it kind of it has that a lot through it. And I mean, there's obviously a lot of other tones and music styles that also will I think come into play. But like having that be the first like segment the first song opening us into this world is just oh so yeah awesome <laughs> yes. nice okay all right uh, so now we'll go ahead we'll move on uh to your show shannon <laughs> to my show yes, yes. <laughs> um i 
totally made this show. No, <laughs> yeah, I made Dragon Ball Z. Um, <laughs> I wish. Okay, so I actually don't watch a lot of a lot of TV. Um, just because I most of my screen time involves playing mm-hmm. video games, and I wish I had enough free time to do everything I wanted, but I don't. Uh, anyway, but I have been while being quarantined here at home been watching Dragon Ball Z with my husband. Uh, We have the uh, full DVD special edition (laughs) set, Um, but I do know that if you want to watch it for free, you can stream it on Funimation's website. Um, There are ads if you want to watch it for free, but I mean, that's like just watching it on TV with commercials. So um, I had never watched Dragon Ball Z before I met my husband uh, because I always thought it looked like a silly kids show. Yeah. Like I, I remember my brother watching it when it was on television uh, back in the day, but I was like, what is this? This looks silly, whatever. But uh, my husband was like, no, you're going to sit down and watch it with me because it's amazing. And he was right. <laughs> um, I do. I am totally uh, a Dragon Ball Z fan now. Um, it is just, So, I I mean, a lot of people know what Dragon Ball Z is. But in case you don't, it's based on a manga by Akira Toriyama. And there's actually been uh, four shows, animes, based on the manga. There's the original Dragon Ball, then Dragon Ball Z, then Dragon Ball GT, which we don't talk about, and then (laughs) Dragon Ball Super. Uh, And uh, I... So we're almost done with Dragon Ball Z. I could talk about all the seasons now because we're almost finished with season nine, which is the last one. <laughs> yes, I know. We like, we're just finishing this thing up. Yep. And um, I did watch the dub version to, you know, give you a heads up. I do like the dub version just because I don't have to read uh, that way. But my husband prefers the Japanese version. You know, they're they're both good, but the the nice thing is like on Funimation's website and with a DVD mm-hmm. you can do either one. So um, also I like Goku's voice in the English version better than the Japanese version. Also Vegeta's voice. Okay, anyway, mm-hmm. um, so with Dragon Ball Z, uh, I can tell you my favorite seasons, and I know this. So it's kind of confusing because when it aired on television, there was seven seasons, mm-hmm. but when they released the special edition DVDs, there's nine. <laughs> so it's like what uh so i'm going off the nine season one when i'm talking about this because that's what we have um so my favorite season was season three which is the frieza saga known as the frieza saga uh season six which is known as the cell game saga and then season seven which is known as the other world great Saiyan and world tournament sagas yes (laughs) i know each season has like a saga name um and i I can, I can tell you my least favorite season was season five because uh, it felt like it dragged. And that's like the Android and Cell saga. And yeah, I don't know why. I just like that season just felt like the episodes dragged and I couldn't take Cell is one of the bad guys. He's mm-hmm. one of the villains. I couldn't take him seriously because uh, he his feet squeak every time he walks. I know. I'm not kidding. Like he walks and it's like squeaky. Squeaky, squeak. And I was like, what are they doing? Yeah, it was hilarious. So uh, during the Cell Game saga, he didn't walk as much. So it was much easier to take him seriously because it was mostly fighting. Um, let's see. My favorite characters in Dragon Ball um, are Vegeta and Piccolo and Gohan. Mostly because they have the most character development throughout the series. Mm-hmm. Uh you, do you know Dragon Ball, by the way? Uh, Have you? I, <laughs> I know enough to know that at this point in my life, I'm not invested at all in watching it. Um, but I recognize definitely like all the character names and such. And I, yes. I've been forced I mean, to watch pretty several pretty episodes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So yeah, no, I think those three. There's in the beginning seasons the relationship between Piccolo and Gohan. Um, because Piccolo started out as a, a villain in the mm-hmm. original Dragon Ball. And he becomes a hero. Same with Vegeta. He starts out as a villain too and becomes a hero. So basically, I like the how they develop from being villains into heroes. Mm. 
uh, they, you know, they learn to have friends and they learn to love and, and everything, which I, I appreciate that, um, the character development in the anime. Um, and then Gohan, I just like because, so he's Goku's oldest son. And you see him develop from like a very small child uh, to a teenager throughout the series. And he has to save the world several times. And for such a little kid, he had a lot of uh, weight on his shoulders, but he handled it well. And he's a very smart kid. And yeah, basically, I that's why they're my favorite. And um, so Dragon Ball, it's not just fighting, though most of it, mm-hmm. the series is, you know. And yes, there are episodes where, like, you're waiting for them to fight because they're getting powered up, and you're like, oh my god, mm-hmm. just, like, finish powering up. But at the same time, it's still, they can still have really profound moments. And then what I've noticed um, is, since it's supposed to be, like, a kid's show, mm-hmm. um, though, like, as an adult, you can totally love it, uh, they'll have a few episodes of like really heavy stuff, and then they'll have like a comedic episode mm-hmm. in between to like lighten the mood, uh, which is um, which is nice because you know for kids that they're like oh my gosh these two people just died in the last episode, and then the next episode is like ooh we're trying to find the Dragon Balls and it's funny so and the way they keep it like a kids show even with people dying all the time is that basically you can collect the dragon balls and that summons Shenron, the uh, the great Kami dragon, and he will grant uh, wishes so you can wish people back from the dead. So they come back. They always come back. I, I feel like I remember that being a thing in this <laughs> universe. Yeah. I was just like, yeah. what the heck? <laughs> well, yeah. So like, and I mean, and in fact, when they're dead, they put like, they show you like, the, like the afterlife and stuff and it looks like a good time so it's not like you know horrible or anything so I, I you know it's 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 really interesting and I like how it can be really serious but also silly mm. um, which is it's actually a nice thing to watch right now during quarantine because you get some of the the catharsis from the serious moments but then you can be like this is just ridiculous you know and just <laughs> laugh about it so, um, my favorite scene, um, I, it would be kind of a spoiler alert. Mm-hmm. So I'll just say it happens in season eight and it involves Vegeta. And it's like, I should tell people, close your ears if you don't want to hear us. Um, it's, yeah, I just won't say it because, you know, I mean, a lot of people have seen it, but I would feel bad to be like, this is what happens in season eight. You don't have to watch it now. But let's just say it happens with Vegeta and I bawled my eyes out and we stopped it. And my husband was like, it's going to be OK. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, gosh, I know it is. He's <laughs> But yeah. Um, and then. Let's see, we I I do have to say. Um, I stand Vegabule, uh, Buell, Vegabule. I think that's how the fans pronounce it. I've only like read it, you know. I don't like talk about it with other people. But what that means, it's the relationship between Vegeta and Bulma. Mm-hmm. And I don't know why. Like I got into Dragon Ball Z, and then suddenly I was like, oh my god, I stand these two so much. <laughs> I've even started reading like fan fiction comics oh and stuff about them. Yeah, like, I'll just, like, Google it and find, because I just love the, those two so much, like, in our relationship together. Uh, shout out to, um, there is a comic online, and I have to do the shout out, because it's really good, and if you mm. love Dragon Ball Z, and want to know how the relationship between Vegeta and Bulma, like, happened between the, the seasons where they weren't even together, and she was with Yancha, and then the next season where suddenly they have a baby. Um, like, if you want to know what happens, it's called, uh, Dragon Ball Z First Kiss by an artist online, comic book artist, he or she, uh, is really, really good. Um, they're called Long Love Vegeta, and, uh, you can check them out on Twitter, and on Twitter, it's at Long Love Vegeta, and then, like, they have a link to the comic book, uh, the webcomic, and, yeah, so I totally suggest that because it's 
one of the best ones I've found. So if you stand them too, I would suggest that. Um, and then, yeah, we're almost done with season nine. And next will be Dreamin' Dragon Ball Super because I'm really excited to see yeah. the next. <laughs> I, I remember when that one was coming out, uh, my ex-boyfriend, he really, really loved it. And I remember getting the updates every single week uh, for Dragon Ball Super and what was happening. So I, good luck, the best of luck going into that show. Yeah, right? no, I'm, I'm, Ooh. I'm excited for it's it. It's something, because... it's something else. <laughs> yes, it is. It's like a total thing The like the Dragon Ball, we even just bought one of the fighting games for the PlayStation and we've been playing that. So it's like a whole Dragon Ball quarantine thing going on right now. <laughs> So, and moving on from things we really, really love, this is my segue for your next, your last Thank one. You. You're right. welcome. She um, loves Nick Cage. I, I do really deeply, passionately love Nick Cage. Um, probably since an early age of uh, seeing uh, National Treasure, because that's my generation. Um, I. I always, <laughs> okay, I'm going to do this on camera and regret it, but it's fine. But everyone asks me, it's like, oh, what's your favorite Nicolas Cage quote? I'm like, oh, it's the one in National Treasure where he's like really serious. And there's just like, they're like in the room with the decoration. And they're just like, Ben, what is it? And he just goes, it's just the last time this was here. It was being signed for the first time. And I don't know what it is about <laughs> that quote, but I laugh hysterically and feel like such a passion in that moment. I'm just like, Nick Cage, you are the man. So with this, my friend group also uh, loves Nicolas Cage. And the last thing that we kind of got to do together, I think, sorry if I'm wrong, friends who are watching this, um, like we all got together and we decided we were going to watch Nicolas Cage in Vampire's Kiss um, from 1989. And a lot of people probably actually don't realize that they're aware that this movie exists um, because there's this famous meme that was going around for a while of just like Nicolas Cage like the bulging eyes and like looking crazy and that's from this movie uh, and there's just the, so many other things in this film like it is the most meme filled movie I have watched that was around before memes were a thing uh, it's just wow what a trip. And if you are a fan of the cage and have not seen this yet, you should go to Hoopla, check this out. Um, definitely have a chunk of time saved because I feel like this was like at least two hours long, this film. Um, somehow it was two hours long. Uh, but it is it is worth it because if you read up on interviews with Nicolas Cage and like all these things about this film, like he regards this as like one of his favorite things to work on and I don't understand it except for the fact that it is a complete like actor's dream of just doing whatever you want and getting away with it like it I'm is pretty just, sure that's Nick Cage's career I mean probably <laughs> but like I've also never seen him act so much in a thing like in this one, I can arguably say that I I don't think he's just acting like Nicolas Cage. I think he's acting like some weird eldritch horror that I can't even like identify. <laughs> because it's just so insane what you see in this film. Uh, so the summary of this film is that Nicolas Cage is this dude living in New York, living his life. Uh, he has a hard time connecting with other people and he goes to a therapist for it. Um, and then one day he's on a date with this girl. Things seem to be going great and a bat comes flying in. Um, and then all of a sudden from there, he is convinced that he has been bitten by a vampire and is turning into a vampire. And this entire film is just his descent into madness. Um <laughs> It really, really is madness what you go through because you think you're at a point and you're like, it can't get worse than this. And let me tell you, it does. Um, like, just the whole film is just so insane. Uh, so I will be upfront and say that there are some triggers in this film. Like, there is, like, some, I feel like, sexual assault that happens a little bit. It's not, like, super graphic, but it is, like, even in... For me, like, watching it, I was like, this is alarming. I cannot believe, like, that this isn't a film. Like, oh my gosh, this is terrible. Like, he, his character is a terrible person. And everything about this film is just like, you're like, no, this is, like, toxic masculinity at its, like, 
I don't even want to say finest because that's not a good adjective for this, but it, at its worst, um, cause it's just, oh my gosh, it's horrifying. But like the, then you, it's these layers of like horrifying scenes of like I said, terrible, 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 like cultural views. And then all of a sudden the next scene you have this like completely maddening, hilarious, meme-worthy thing. And then you're just like, should I be laughing right now? I feel like I shouldn't be laughing, but I am because this is but so incredibly laughing. ridiculous. Um, this movie is known for their, there's a scene where Nicolas Cage just jumps up on a desk like a cat and he's just like yelling at people. There's like a scene where he eats um, a cockroach and he actually does eat it. Um, like there's this article uh, I was reading about like the background of this film and the process of it all. Um, which, if anybody has seen this film or wants to know more about the madness, um, go um, look up the article that's um, posted by The Ringer um, because, wow, it's a long one, but you find out so much more and you're just like, wow, I didn't think this could get worse. Um, but yeah, no, he, he eats a cockroach in the film and he actually did that twice while they were shooting it because he felt like he needed to do it for the scene um like he was very much so into this like method okay. acting for this film which is terrifying oh my god <laughs> like it really is like if you just want to be on a trip of a show just go and watch this movie folks and like i said it's fun to watch with friends uh so maybe if you want to wait until you know we can all get back together again and watch it like it's worth it but if you just need something that's just completely going to take your attention away from maybe like real world stuff and just like immerse you in chaos um this maybe is your next tiger king like it's just so so weird it oh sounds like God. something that will definitely get your mind off of everything that's going on in the world right now if yeah the cage is just if they just like let him off the leash basically it, it sounds like it really is it really really <laughs> is like bravo i guess to nicholas cage um and earlier we were talking about weird accents and things and let me tell you the biggest thing you have to like get over in this film is nicholas cage's accent like you listen to it and you're just like oh are you what is that? What are you trying I've to seen do? I've Con Air, so I'm used to him having terrible accents. Yeah. Yes, it's 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 like a Con Air situation where you're like, just stop, please. Yeah, don't yeah. that's how it feels. And you read the interviews, and it was an intentional choice that the director agreed that they should leave in. Um, and it's like a mixture of this like transatlantic British something, and it's <laughs> so annoying. Fun to impersonate, but so annoying. Oh my gosh. Um, so yeah, that's All right. that's Vampire's that's Kiss. Vampire's Good Kiss. luck to anybody who decides to go and watch it. Let us know um, how you recover from that's it afterwards. All right. So we've only got a couple minutes left. Yes. Um, and in the chat, there was uh, compliments on your um, imitation. Oh my Just, gosh. Um, <laughs> Thank yes. you. Thank so, you. And uh, yeah. And oh, also, is that a pirate ship back there behind yes, you? Yes, it is indeed. Um, I don't know if it's a pirate ship, but it's definitely ships. Uh, of Star. yeah. Well, you know what? That turned out to be appropriate because I talked about truth, which totally as pirates. intentional, totally intentional, totally intentional. So, all right. Well, we hope you guys enjoyed our first episode, our first stream about what we've been consuming, uh, this past month and. Just uh, to let you guys know, we are planning on doing this the third Tuesday mm -hmm. of every month. So our next stream will be on Tuesday, June 16th at 7 p.m. Uh, and then you got anything else to say, Shannon, before we sign off? Uh, yeah, so I'll go ahead and throw up on here uh, just our other social media things that we have. So if you like this content, you want more library content, uh, we've got all the social medias. Uh, our hope is to eventually post these vlogs uh, onto YouTube or something, other platforms like other people can also get access if they haven't heard of it or if you miss a week because you're busy. Um, but yeah, here, go ahead, jot down any of the other social media that we got. Um, and we're just really thankful that you guys tuned in tonight to watch us talk about things. And uh, I'm looking forward to the next uh, time when we can all get together to get and chat. Me too. I, this was fun. So, and you know, uh, I hope everybody liked the suggestions and, you know, feel free to, you know, get on our 
the social media channels and you know send us a message or something letting us know if you watched or read what we suggested because that would be amazing so thanks for watching and we'll see you next month and have a good night yep toodaloo